Welcome to CS4510. Uh, yeah, CS4510. L13B. The topic of today is called Rice's Theorem. And a posts a correspondence problem. So we're dealing with a sort of a rigorous undertaking and study of the undecidable. Problems that are, we can prove that there do not exist algorithms for certain problems, but we can do so provably. Kind of interesting. So although we can't really, we don't really know what, how to solve any problems, we kind of know that we can't solve the problems, which is pretty useful. Um, so today is basically uh, to help us flesh out this understanding of what is doable and not doable. Uh, two important things. First off, uh, the languages that we gave last time, we've given several languages to be undecidable. Halt, ATM, ETM, EQTM, and more are all undecidable, but they, they all share something in common, which is the self-reference part is easy because they're all about questions about Turing machines. They are themselves about Turing machines. Rice's theorem is going to basically tell us that anything interesting about Turing machines is an undecidable problem. So it's a generalization of all these proofs. The next question you should ask is, well, are only the things that are undecidable about Turing machines, OK? Because all of that in the end is conditional on the church Turing thesis. Post-correspondence problem is a simple game that we can prove through reduction has no algorithm. But the phrasing of the problem is such that it has nothing to do with Turing machines. It's not about Turing machine encodings or something. So we'll prove that every interesting problem about Turing machines is un unsolvable, and also the only interesting problems about Turing machines, uh, there are problems not about Turing machines that are also unsolvable. Those are a little rarer. But um, before we do that, I want to talk about um, sort of the relationship that these machines have to automata. So we have three big classes. We have the DFA, we have the NFA, we have the, uh, we have the re regular expression. We also have, what else goes here, the... GNFA, the regular grammar, like three other things, right? Um, and with, then in the second class, we have the CFG. We have the PDA. The third class, we have the Turing machine, the unrestricted grammar, the two PDA, whatever, all the Turing complete models of computation. Let's consider uh, certain language problems to be decidable or undecidable for these classes, OK? So. I'm going to put a blank to mean the acceptance problem for that class. Um, e blank, uh, EQ blank, and then one we didn't talk about, but you could probably do as an exercise is all blank. Does this machine accept all strings? Okay. So let's put a D for decidable and a U for undecidable, right? Uh, the acceptance problems for Turing machines: decidable or undecidable? ATM is undecidable. EQTM, decidable or undecidable? Undecidable. ETM, undecidable. Is all TM undecidable? Probably. Uh, what about DFA? Suppose we're not working with Turing machines. I give you a DFA and a word. Does that DFA accept the word? Is that a decidable problem? Why? Just run the DFA. Just run the DFA. It always halts. So, yeah, decidable. Um, it'll always reach an accept or a reject state. What about the emptiness problem for DFAs? If I give you DFA, does it accept any string? Decidable or undecidable? If you run like the first um, two k string machine, like it's like two times the number of states. I thought we did this for a homework assignment. I don't think I really remember. Oh, yeah. Which, which, it is decidable? So what's the algorithm? What, what is the procedure to decide it? This is an algorithms question, not a computability question. I forgot what, do you remember what we, I think you know what I'm talking about. What did we do on the homework where we showed that you can like, every Turing machine or every uh, DFA is describable by like it's how it acts on all strings of length. Or a length away. I forgot what the length was. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can you can test 
two DFA. You can test two DFAs to be equivalent, but that's for EQ DFA. Oh, well, you just just check if it's equivalent to the DFA that only exists. That also works. Yes, the equivalence problem for DFAs can be done by checking them on finite at least strings if you did an exercise. You can also prove the equivalence problem for DFAs because they're closed under symmetric difference. And the symmetric difference is empty if and only if they're the equal. So you can do closure. Um, well, the answer I was looking for EDFA e e was more like, you just do graph search. Just see if an accept state is reachable. If it is, then that is the path to an accept state, which is an accepted string. That's, that's the emptiness problem. If that's not true, you explore a finite graph, you'll find that out, right? If the, if the only accepted states are in some disconnected component, then search, certainly it accepts no strings. Um, all DFA, um, why is that decidable? All DFA is decidable by just checking if an accept state is reachable. Excuse me, a reject state is reachable. The same algorithm as EDFA to see if is there a path to a reject state, then that machine doesn't accept all strings, QED. So that's also decidable, OK? What about uh, the accepted? What's wrong with it? All DFA is just like, if this thing is a valid DFA. Yeah, the input here is a DFA in a word. The input here is a DFA. The input here is two DFAs, and the input here is a DFA. OK. Yeah. Easy, easy. So it's looking at the code. What can you determine? Looking at the code of a Turing machine, you can basically determine nothing. Looking at the code of a DFA, you can basically determine everything. What about CFGs? Is a CFG decidable or undecidable? Give me an algorithm to determine if a CFG generates a word. Start with the word and move backwards from the um, yeah. like from the productions. I suppose that would work. I guess the answer I was looking for though is Chomsky normal form. Convert the gram to Chomsky normal form. If a word is produced, it takes exactly two n minus one steps. Brute force all two n minus productions of length two n minus one. If your word is in the list, congrats, it was produced. If not, it wasn't. So decidable. What about emptiness for CFGs? Is emptiness for CFGs decidable or undecidable? Give me an algorithm to determine, given a CFG or even a PDA, if it accepts a string or not. This one, I think, is a little difficult. I would say that you could decide if a CFG generates a string at all by trying to backtrack from, like, given a, given a production with the right-hand side being all terminals, try and backtrack to see if that can produce somehow. Mark its left-hand side, and then mark those left-hand side recursively, and so on until you get to the start. Yes? Sorry, 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 sorry. non-terminal to non-terminal, connect it, and then do graph search again until you reach it. Graph would be infinite, and that would only be a recognizer. But that would work. The nodes are all, you only have a node for every non-terminal. Oh, that would basically almost be a PDA. Yeah. With a little, with, I think, a more formal formalization, I think that would work. Decidable. What about equivalence of CFGs? Chomsky normal form again, right? Chomsky normal form does not guarantee that if two grammars are semantically equivalent that they will be converted to the same normal form. Okay. Unfortunately, it's misnamed. It's not a real normal form if we were to find a normal form in that sense. That semantic equality can be determined by syntactic equality. Um, these are undecidable. I just wanted to see if you guys can come up with algorithms for them. You can't. You probably cannot. Um, equality of uh, CFG is EQ CFG, not a hard Proof, actually, just takes like 40 minutes. So it, you can prove that the equality of CFGs cannot be done. Same thing for all. And in fact, all because EQ, the, that reduction works, right? EQ CFG, you can reduce from EQ. All CFG, you can reduce from EQ CFG, and so on. Yes? Would you need like two stacks, and it's kind of similar to like push down automata? Like dub two? Equality of CFGs, how do you determine if two CFGs produce all the rights, all exactly and only the same strings? No, I'm not arguing that it's not undecidable. I'm just like asking, is it the reason it's undecidable is because you kind of need two stacks for the two different automatas, and then it, that becomes a Turing machine? Well, the reduction, r r an algorithm that decides the quality of CFGs is not itself a CFG. We're asking a general algorithm, like any code. You construct code, like a Turing machine, 
the Turing machine takes as input two CFGs and determines if they're equal. So it does have two stacks. That would be okay. I see what you're saying. No, that's fine. That's that's it does have two stacks. I guess my question is like I was trying to ask like elucidate the proof a little bit more. Like, does it revolve around the fact that you need two stacks? Or is, am I, just I I don't think so. I mean, part of the proof is that you know when a CFG produces a string non-deterministically, but you don't know when it doesn't. How do you know if a string is not produced? How do you know if it's not produced in the future or something like this? Do you know that is to, to determine to determine that is, is undecidable? How do you know that a CFG produces all strings and doesn't miss any? That also is undecidable. Aren't CFGs not closed under intersection? Exactly. Like it feels like if they were, you would get deterministic CFGs, which it would be decidable for. Yeah. Because then you simply do closure. You get complement when you get intersection. So you simply just construct the symmetric difference again, and then guess what? You've got an equality grammar that's empty, this empty if and only if. It's you go the reverse direction from an equality construct. Because that, like, that would be a nice proof to you, like, assume to the contrary that it is, and then arrive at the fact that they're closer to intersection. Because like, the idea that you can determine the equality of any two random things in the group seems exactly and only equivalent to the fact that you can compute the intersection of them in some manner. I'll tell you the proof is going to use the technique we'll do today, which is uses the method, method of computation histories. So basically, you'll construct a grammar to produce a string if and only if a machine accepts a word. The machine, the string that is produced, is going to end up being the computation history of the machine. So we'll do the technique today, in fact. Right. Anyway, this chart is supposed to demonstrate that the, more, the stronger in power your automata gets, the less you can learn about the machines, the languages, the behaviors of the machines from the descriptions of the machines. Again, these are all questions about looking at the code. What can you determine about the behavior? These are questions about the behavior. Emptiness, acceptance, all equivalence. These are about the basic, intuitively, these are things that you detest by turning the machine on, quote unquote, and not just looking at a diagram of the machine. The, what that actually means in a more formal sense is kind of difficult to pin down, but that's intuitively what happens here. And the stronger and more powerful your machine gets, the less solvable its problems are. It's a gradient. In fact, I, I claim you put DCGFGs, it'll be, it'll be in between here, it would, be, it would have more decidable problems than CFGs, as we, as we just said, but some of the, the same decidable problems as CFGs. You put context fee grammars here, it'll be even more undecidable, right? Which ones exactly, I don't remember. But it's know that it basically gradients until you get to the Turing machine. No property of Turing machines is basically decidable, which is what Rice's theorem says. Rice's theorem is what we'll just segue into. Um, any semantic non-trivial property of Turing machines is undecidable. Now, what does semantic and non-trivial mean? Semantic means like the, the uh, uh, non-trivial, we'll do first, non-trivial means uh, that uh, there exists some machines M1 and M0 such that M1 is an element of the property and that M0 is not an element of the property. A, a, a property is said to be a partition of the st strings that are Turing machines, such that every machine either has or hasn't the property. A property is non-trivial if, the if there exists a Turing machine with the property and without the property. An example of a trivial property is M is a Turing machine that has zero or more states. That is a trivial property, because every Turing machine has zero or more states. By what we mean is this language, L. The, the machine encoding is M such that M has, or even I'll even say L of M, has the property. Whatever the property is. Emptiness. Equivalence. Well, no, because it has to be not of pairs of machines or machines in words, but simply machines. Right? Um, it is undecidable to determine, given an arbitrary program, if it is a virus or not. The virus is a machine we may define which writes at some point in the future a description of itself on the tape. A virus makes copies of itself. That's sort of an OK definition. It's undecidable, given an arbitrary Turing machine, to determine if it'll ever write down a copy of itself on the tape. It's actually, we don't even know if such a machine can exist. We haven't proven it. Does there exist a Turing machine which outputs its own description? We'll prove that later. Um, it's undecidable to determine if a program has a memory leak. We may define, in a Turing sense, a memory leak to be 
a machine that on some specific input diverges and writes one infinitely on the tape. That sounds like a memory leak on a specific input. It's undecidable in general to determine if a machine has a memory leak. Kind of related to halting on that one, but you can see that to be true. All properties you would w wish to test of a program, static analysis, dynamic analysis, all these things are faced with the big uh, against the wall that is Rice's theorem, which is that you basically can't provably do anything. That does not prevent people from tra trying. There are papers where people write like uh, memory leak testers, and they basically run tr tr 10 billion lines of code at it, and they'll find one or two bugs. You know, They'll find special cases. They won't be able to do it in general. And good for them. They found special cases. You, know? you can plug in you know, the Linux kernel source code into these static analysis analyzers, and it'll say, well, memory leak, one memory leak found. No guarantee it finds every memory leak, every, every memory leak, but it, when it gives you a hit, you go inspect it, and you go, oh, OK, yeah, that was memory leak. You, know? you can do something like that. Um, that's it, though. You can't, you can't do it in general. That's what Rice's theorem says. There need only be like one example of M1 or one example of M0. You, yeah. They don't need to be both infinite partitions? No. Nope. In fact, if uh, we'll do the next one actually, which implies they're infinite partition. Semantic. Uh, okay, if they're if they're in, if they're not infinite partitions, one of them is finite. So you can decide the property by hard coding every machine that. Yeah. yeah. So semantic basically, this is hard to formalize, but basically it's about uh, the the language of the machine and not about the machine itself. It is semantic. It is about the behavior, the language of the machine, but not about the language. You could try to come up with a definition about this. It's invariant to the re ways you could recode a machine or something like this, but it's difficult. All right? M, as, as an example of a syntactic property would be um, M is a machine with 17 states. That's decidable. You could just count the states. There's nothing undecidable about that. But you could, if you were to say M recognizes a language which is decidable by a Turing machine with 17 states, perhaps a different Turing machine, that is undecidable. right? It's intuitively about the language and not the strings. Another property which doesn't fit into like talking about the language is like M uses the third cell of its tape exactly twice. Something like this. You know, that is a property about the behavior of the machine when you turn it on. How do you determine if that actually does it or not? Uh, you have it's undecidable. It's undis In fact, Alan Turing, his original paper, he gave the halting problem. He gave some other examples. Does it ever? Does a machine which loops infinitely printing a, printing a certain sequence? Does it ever write down a one? That's an undecidable problem, and it's basically like a primordial Rice's theorem is what he proved. Yes? Why is halt like the quintessential example? Halt is like a complete, like SAT is an NP-complete problem. Halt is like a recognizable complete problem. Yeah. It's proven unconditionally so by diagonalization. Um, that's all I think I want to say on that one. Okay. Uh, right. So here's what we're going to do, is we're just going to give, uh, let's let this language be L for whatever property it is that is semantic and non-trivial. We're going to give a uh, reduction from ATM uh, to L. But we'll phrase this one in a proof by uh, contradiction. Assume to the contrary. Well, actually, we'll call it P. A P is decidable. Uh, then uh, without loss of generality, suppose that the empty set hasn't the property. Why is that OK to assume without loss of generality that the empty set hasn't the property? The machines that recognize the empty set are not part of the property. Why is that OK to assume in our proof? If not, then we would assume that it does have the property and then choose P complement, which is exactly the same. We would just choose the to pro prove that P complement was undecidable, which is the same thing. So, And by non-triviality, suppose. Uh, that there exists M1, uh, some string with, with the property P, OK? We give a decider for ATM as follows. A on input uh, M comma W. It's going to build M prime hard coded from uh, M, W, and M1. 
Actually, I'm going to call this MP or property. Simulate um, no, wrong line. Uh, if M prime, the code that you have constructed but not ran, has the property except else reject. Now, of course, the true science is what goes on in M prime. M, excuse me, MP on input X, it has, uh, excuse me, uh, M prime has hard coded M, W, and M, P. Okay? It has three hard coded variables, constants M, W, and M, P. M and W are the input to the decider for ATM, and M, P is the machine that has the property. We're basically, M prime is basically going to pretend it's M, P if M accepts W and not otherwise. Uh, simulate. M on W. If M accepts W, simulate uh, MP on X. If it accepts, accept. Essentially, what's going to happen here is M prime is going to pretend it has the property if and only if M accepts W. And it's going to pretend it doesn't have the property if and only if m does not accept w. So if m comma w is in ATM, that's true if and only if um, L of m prime is equal to L of mp. Well, that's true if and only if uh, uh, the code of m prime is in p. Right? Similarly, uh, if m prime, if, if m comma w is not an ATM, then m loops or rejects w, so we know that m prime is going to accept no strings, right? And by our assumption, without loss of generality, the empty set hasn't the property. DVD. Question on the proof of Rice's theorem? You should have one or two, I think. The semanticness is not obvious where it falls in, right? And it's not necessarily a question always about the language. You question? Oh. It's not always a question about the language either. For example, let's use the example of M uses the third cell exactly twice. Or let's say M uses the third cell at all, okay? Suppose it's a work tape where it's not like Immediately, it has to read it or something, OK? What you would do is, you, in the simulation of M on W, you would say, simulate M on W, but don't touch the third cell. And then, if M accepts W, touch the third cell, something like this. So you would make sure that you touch the third cell if and only if M accepts W. If M does not accept W, make sure not to touch the third cell. Kind of, basically, to apply Rice's theorem is dangerous. Like, I'll tell you this is a, as a warning. Uh, often when people are supposed to do a reduction, they'll apply, try to apply Rice's theorem, and it, sometimes, sometimes they fail. Uh, so don't try to apply Rice's theorem when you, it's better, you're better off doing a reduction, because it's not obvious when you can or can't. Uh, exactly. It's really easy to misapply. So you can't just wave your wand and say, you know, all these are undecidable. I don't, uh, I'm not going to deal with it, because sometimes they are decidable, um, because it's not a syntactic property or it's a trivial property or something, right? Um, questions on this? Like, essentially, M cannot accidentally trigger the property while it's simulating. And exactly. That's, that's the problem full stop. Exactly, exactly. Which is why we suppose to the contra we suppose, excuse me, with almost generally the empty set has, hasn't the property. Why does something super finite not work? Something what? Like, finite from some finite set of things. What do you mean? Um, so, in fact, finiteness is a semantic property. You could let, consider the set of Turing machines that only accept finitely many strings. Yeah. Such a language would be semantic. That would be semantic, and you could apply Rice's theorem. Here's what you would do is instead of simulate MP on X, you, you, could, you would continue to simulate MP on X. MP on X would only accept finitely many strings. So the language here would be finite. The empty set actually is also finite, so that would not work. You would, in fact, actually, 
You can only prove the, the set of machines that M accepts a finite language to be undecidable by, by proving the complement, which is that M accepts an infinite language to be undecidable. That proof actually re is, requires the same reason ETM. We have to prove the complement of it, same thing happens. But like, if I were to say my symmetric property is that M is exactly this thing, like this Turing machine. What do you mean exactly this Turing machine? Like this specific code of a Turing machine? Specific code of exactly one representation of... That is a syntactic property. It's, a be, it's, a, it's about the description, but yeah. not about the language. Well, why doesn't that work from a... Like, where in the proof does that fall? Like, I see where properties about infinite things that you could accidentally trigger in the simulate M on W step, but what about, like, a finite thing? So there exists uh, empty set. Let's suppose the, that, that specific machine does not recognize the empty set. Assume to the, so suppose the empty set is not in the property and there's exactly one machine with the property. That property is decidable, so the proof should fail. Yeah. Why does the proof fail? M is going to pretend to be that machine on all inputs, but M will not have exactly that description. So that implies there's two machines with the property. MP would not, be, M prime would not be M whatever your property machine is. There we go. Interesting way that fails, but yeah. More questions on Rice's theorem? Great applications of this to program testing, and perhaps only applications of this to program testing. The, the software analysis guys are really up against the wall on this. You know, algorithm guys are up against the wall because there are NP complete problems. And they're like, oh no, I have to use an exponential time algorithm. But software analysis guys have to go against Rice's theorem, which is not, there's an exponential, there's not that there's, you know, sometimes NP complete problems have randomized or approximate algorithms for them. Not too good, but still good enough in practice. Property testing guys don't have anything, you know, it's there's no algorithm at all. So uh, the algorithm guys are a little whiny in, in that regard, right? So, all right, if no more questions on that, we'll get on to uh, post correspondence problem. Post, ML post uh, is, a, is a tragedy in, in as, a, as a biography of him. ML post basically like proved everything almost, but a sl slightly after everyone else did. So he proved, um, he basically proved something like uh, the Turing machine, he invented the, something like the Turing machine, we now call it post machine, but he didn't have anything close to a church Turing thesis. He had like a two page paper, he said, I hope someone in the future would perhaps make an equivalence between this and the um, intuitive concept of computation. And, you know, Alan Turing, younger guy than him, beat him to the press by several months. So he didn't get any notoriety for that because he was missing the philosophy, he was missing the church Turing thesis. He almost solved. Uh, several open problems, but was beaten to the press by several other months. He proved the word problem for groups was unde semi groups was undecidable. He was beaten to the press by Markov of Markov chains. Um, anyway, throughout history, he was like uh, uh, almost the guy who solved the problem and then never good enough to do so. And he uh, was getting like electroshock therapy for depression. They would just they would just electro electrocute people for like ailments, I don't know. And then he like died of that, so tragic. Oh, and he like didn't have one arm or something. So basically the guy was, I mean, uh, a very sad story. Um, but should be recognized more than he is. I mean, he should be way more recognized than he is because he really did everything that everyone else did, including Godel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, but he just didn't do it as good and no one recognized it at the time. So rigor is very important. You know, you need to convince your contemporaries. Anyway, uh, Emil Post came up with this problem called the Coast Post. It's called post-correspondence problem. And basically, it's a little game. We have a set of finitely many dominoes, and you're asked for a sequence of concatenations of these dominoes to produce the same string. So consider we have the finite, this finite set. You have a finite set of tiles, or dominoes. Each one contains a string on the top and a string on the bottom. Okay. And you are allowed infinitely many copies from this set of dominoes, the set of tiles. Okay, choose a sequence of infinitely many copies of the dominoes to concatenate together, such that the top of the concatenations of the top is equal to the concatenations of the bottom. Right? Consider the the let's say this is one, two, three, four. Consider uh, two, one, three, two, four. Okay. I'm going to take a copy of two, a copy of one, a copy of three, a copy of two, and a copy of four. Let's see what happens. We have A over AB concatenated with B over CA concatenated with 
CA over A concatenated with A over AB concatenated with ABC over C. Now let's concatenate the tops and the bottoms. We're going to get A, B, C, A, A, B, C, A, 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 B, C, right? The concatenations of the bottoms are going to be what? A, B, C, A, 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 B, C, right? Just to be clear about where these come from, Right? They're partitioned differently, but they're the same. It's A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. So this is what we would say a set of tiles that has a match. Post -correspond problem, post correspondence, post correspondence problem basically says, consider the languages of encodings of tiles, finitely sets of tiles, so that P has a match. And again, a match is a sequence of the tiles which may be concatenated to so the top concatenations equal the bottom concatenations. This set, PCP, is undecidable. It is algorithmically unsolvable. Given a, in general, in generality, I give you a set of tiles. I say, find me a match if this set has a match or not. It is undecidable to do so. Importantly, in the wording of this question is that there's nothing to do with Turing machines. There's nothing about computation. We view computation automata as applications of this transition function some number of times, and we see the machine moving. You can literally like feel it. That's not obvious that this that is translated at all here at all. You know, there's nothing like that here. This is a very simple combinatorial problem, and that there does not exist an algorithm for it, exponential or otherwise, at all. There is no algorithm for this. This is, an un this is an unsolvable problem, right? Again, nothing to do with Turing machines. So we prove that basically every problem about Turing machines with Rice's theorem unsolvable. Here's a problem that has nothing to do with Rice's theorem, also unsolvable. Questions on the statement of the formula, the statement of the problem. Like every good problem, there are decidable subproblems of it. You can decide, for example, unary PCP, decidable. Uh, if you have exactly two tiles, decidable. If all, if the tops of all tiles are uh, longer than the top, bottoms of all tiles, decidable. Um, but in general, undecidable problem, right? It's actually, if you have five or more tiles, it's undecidable. Uh, if you have two or less tiles, it's decidable. If you have three or less tiles, it's decidable. And we don't know for the case of four or five, if you have exactly four tiles, if it's decidable or undecidable, right? Some work is still being done on this, but not... It's not important. It's, who cares? This is like Europeans do. You know, they, they got something going on. Anyway, um, what we'll prove is that there is a reduction from ATM to uh, PCP. What we're going to do is create a set of tiles. We're going to hack it. We're going to put, uh, sorry, you had a question? Oh, OK. We're going to put a set of tiles in such a way that we're going to sneak in the transition function of a Turing machine. So if anyone tries to find a match with the, with the set of tiles, they're going to accidentally simulate a machine. That's the way the reduction is going to work, and that kind of blows the smoke out of the way. Uh, out of the way that says, "Oh, look, there's nothing about this about a Turing machine." But the reduction has to come from, of course, a language about Turing machines. That's how we did diagonalization. So, of course, this is it, what it has. Even though the definition of the problem does not involve Turing machines, right? This is sufficient for us to prove it's undecidable. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Questions on the definition? So before we get rigorously into the thing, let's show how we can create sets of tiles to trick an algorithm into doing what we want. Now, an algorithm is allowed to do anything. Anything. I mean, it's an any, any, algorithm is a very general concept, as we understand. But suppose, consider the space of all algorithms that, so, that attempt to solve such a problem. They will attempt to solve it in certain pieces. So what we'll do is create sets of tiles that guarantee certain things for us. So we can choose that if such a solution exists, it, it exists with a certain uh, property that we would like. So for example, consider the, this set of tiles. B over B hash A over B dollar sign 
over a dollar sign, OK? Consider this set of tiles. We can force the algorithm to choose a tile first. Now, we can't actually do that, because the algorithm, there's no, nothing that says the algorithm chooses the tiles in order. But we can argue, sort of, by, by construction, if there did exist a match, this would be the tile to come first. Why is this tile the first to come first? Because none of the tiles, the first letter of the tops and bottoms of all other tiles are not equal. So if this does have a match at all, this has to be the first tile. We can, we, uh, can force the first tile. And again, there's no rule that the algorithm has to choose tiles in order. But if it did choose them in order, we could force this one to be first. If it chose them front to back or back to front, it would eventually have to choose this as the first tile. Yes? No, I'm just Processing? Yeah. OK. We can trick the machine, if it exists, to do this for us. Right? Questions on this one? In fact, something stronger exists. After we've chosen the first tile, the next tile is also chosen for us because the top is longer than the bottom. So if this one is chosen first, the next tile that must be chosen must come from a set that looks like this. Excuse me, B. The bottom of the next tile must begin with a B because there's a B spot here. Right? So you'll choose this tile first, hash B, then you'll choose hash. Right. The next tile has to begin with the B if it's a match at all. B, B. Has to begin with the B. Uh, unless this is just like a match by itself. But it's not. The top is longer than the bottom, forcing the next tile. That's exactly what we can do. So you can force a first tile, then you can force the next tile. That's just induction. We can just force all the tiles then. So what we'll do is create a set of dominoes with exactly one string that can be possible to produce. And that string is going to be what's called the computation history. A computation history is a string that we'll write out this way. It's a concatenation of the configurations of the machine, right? So let's say, I don't know, A, Q, I, W, 2, W, N. Let's say, I don't know, A, B, C, Q, except, something like this, OK? A computation history is a string. It's a string of the computation path, the sequence of accept states of the machine, the sequence of accepting config, the sequence of configurations of the, machi of the machine. C0, C1, CK, CA, right? Convince yourself that such a string only exists if and only if a machine accepts. If the machine loops on W, its computation history is infinitely long and is therefore not a string. If a machine rejects, then it's not an accepting computation history. We'll call it, we'll only look for an accepting computation history. So we'll create a set of tiles that produce an accepting computation history. They must produce an accepting computation history. But such a string only exists if uh, m accepts w. So the tile, that's going to be our solution. Okay. Questions before we, we begin? Question? I mean, I guess sort of from the beginning, we can only force the first tile if there's only one tile which has the same first character on both sides. Correct. So what if there's two? Well, we'll construct an example that won't. We'll be very careful to make sure that we don't do that. In fact, what will happen is we will do that, and we'll have to go back and fix it. That's the way the example will work. So um, our start tile is going to be the following. We're going to add the following tile. The top is only going to contain a hash. The bottom is only going to contain hash q0 w1 dot 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 to wn hash. Okay. This is our start tile. Then we'll do what's called a right move tile. So if you have qi 
read A, write B, move right, and we have QJ. We're going to add the tile um, QIA on top to BQJ. Okay. What this tile is, is the top is the before, the bottom is the after. Okay. Recall that computation is a local process, and as you're taking, as you're computing it, you are slowly rewriting a substring of it each time. That was the proof of the correctness of why universal grammar was trying to complete. It just sort of is a, a finite substring rewrite for each computation step. What we're going to do is, this is going to be our start tile. The next tile has to begin with Q0W1, or some prefix of this, right? So we'll make sure that the only tiles that are available are ones exactly for the transition function. Therefore, the next tile is going to, as, it is, as the selection of tiles are forced to complete this string, here, the next string, the next configuration is appended. So the machine is forced by the first one to write an, the configuration of the machine, but as it does so, the bottom halves of the tile are forced to write the next configuration, repeating this forever. We'll get more into the correctness in a second, but let's finish some more tiles. Um, if we have a left move, unfortunately, we have something slightly more complicated. Let's say we, we're at QI, we read A, write a B, and we move left. Unfortunately, we have to add a set of tiles simply because our configuration notation is unbalanced. We have uh, A, Q, I, A over uh, Q, uh, J, A, B. We have B, Q, I, A over Q, J, B, B. And then we'll have... Double checking. Blank QIA over QJ blank B, right? These are tiles to simulate, simulate a left move, and we simply have to do them because of the imbalance of the configuration. The way that the, the right of the symbol is what the tape head is pointing to. Um, questions on this one? If you run against the tape head. If you what? Run against the tape head in your left move. I can bump up back up against it. I'm going to pretend that we are, for convenience, on a two-way infinite Turing machine. Sure. That's a fine. Yeah. Believe me? OK, thank god. You want to do the simplest it's proof possible? Good. Yeah. I mean, such details end up being quite important, it turns out. Whoa. But you just argue that it, you started on a two-way Turing machine, which can solve exactly and only the same problems as a one-way Turing machine. So. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll even make a greater assumption that suppose that the Turing machine accepts with an empty tape, if I wanted to do so. Why? Instead of accepting, just change the accept state to quickly delete everything and then accept. Clear up the work. So you can make a Turing machine to, you can assume a Turing machine accepts with an empty tape, in fact. Which, you know, so there's so many variants of Turing machines. The variant we gave, like, for use in proofs was the one in the Sipser book, and it's actually very politically chosen to make this, this kind of proof as simple as possible, right? There's a reason for, you know, some books define if you move that the tape is one way infinite, but if you try to move left, you don't just stay put, that you immediately reject. But then you can't use in proof that you touch the, you reject it if and only if you touch the reject state, because the machine may reject by moving off the end of the tape, right? So it's very, it's very well chosen to make it as simple as possible. Here we'll suppose it's a two way infinite tape and also that it accepts with an empty string or something, right? Okay, now we've, we are correct in simulating the left and right move, but we need a lot of helper tiles. Computation is local, the tape may be really long, and only a small part of it is changed at once. Maybe the tape is a thousand symbols currently, and only three symbols are being changed at a time. But we still need to copy the whole configuration over. So we're going to make something called copy tiles. This is just going to copy the tape over for us, the parts that are not near the tape head. There's a problem with adding these tiles. What is it? They're the same on the top and bottom. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, if you add these tiles to any set, that set already has um, a match. Just choose that one tile. So you've trivialized the, the reduction. And this is actually a problem. We'll have to go back and fix it in a second. But just don't worry about that for now. Suppose it always is still the start tile is the only match. For now. We'll fix this, I promise. Um, 
We need a way to go between configurations, so we will also add these tiles. Now, sometimes during the computation, you need more of the blank space. So you add, instead, you add this tile. Right? That'll give you some more work tape. Um, now we need a way to accept. Okay? So notice that all the tiles basically have the property that the bottom is bigger than the top. So we're forcing deficiency with that. The bottom is greater than or equal to the top in length. We need to have a cap piece. If we have a piece like this to start with, and we have a bunch of these pieces, we need a piece like this to end with, right? So we need some sort of end cap piece. So we'll have an end cap piece to be as follows. There is only an end cap that may be applied if and only if the machine accepts. And I could even add some helper. Let's suppose the machine clears up the entire tape and that there's the, 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 the accepting configuration is unique. If I didn't have that assumption, I could create some more tiles that clean up the tape and then make it nice so the end cap fits on. Whatever. It's just sort of a combinatorial thing. But uh, let's suppose we assume the tape is, again, two-way infinite and accepts. There's a single accepting configuration. We can do this. right? Um, All right. Two more quick things about this. Any questions on this before we get to how to fix it? Do you believe the correctness of it? Yes. I just sort of don't get why the end cap is only two characters greater than the start cap, and the start cap could be n characters. Because the accepting configuration, uh, you can only apply, consider any possible um, match that uses the end cap. It can't be the first tile, because it started, the first symbol is not the same as the last symbol. This, these two symbols are different, right? Any, any possible configuration that uses this end cap tile has to have a QA previously on some other tile here, right? In order for this QA to match. Right, but I'm just thinking that the start tile has a bunch of excess. That's yes. Why I'm compensating with this end tile. Uh, simply because I made the assumption that the end tile, the machine itself, before it accepts, goes through a subroutine to clean up the tape. Okay. Yeah. In the process of cleaning it up, you'd add a bunch of tiles that have one more on the top than on the bottom, and you would repeatedly do that exactly the number of times as there are words left on your thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. To give you a, sort of a proof of correctness, we start with this, with this a deficiency on the bottom as C0 hash, OK? Now, as C0 on the top is forced to, to be written, as this performs itself, C1 is written down here, right? Now, unfortunately, it's going to continue its own imbalance. As it's forced to write C1 here, it's forced to write C2 here. Right? Now, by forced, I'm using like improper words here. An algorithm need not choose the tiles in order. We're not proving, we're proving no algorithm exists at all, not only algorithms of certain assumptions we make, but certainly it's true. Like, if it finds a match at all, it, have to, it has to find this as the first tile and this is the second tile. That's what I mean. I don't mean it literally finds them first and second, but this is the tile, the second tile of the match. Now, you can only apply the end cap if and only if uh, the machine accepts. If the machine rejects, the configurations of the machine will contain a QR. But because we specifically don't add a QR tile match, the machine does not, the, the string cannot be matched. If the machine gets stuck in an infinite loop, there are sequences of tiles that don't have a match but may infinitely try to find a match. Right? We gave an example here. Um, this, uh, suppose you didn't have this tile, okay? This is the first tile. You try to, you would keep applying many, infinitely many copies of this tile. You would never find a match. So what some algorithm that tries to find a match for this using that specific greedy method I described would be stuck in an infinite loop, right? Intuitively, that's what's going on. We have one problem to fix, but are there any questions on the correctness of PCP?
OK? The, the problem we need to fix is that we have these extraordinary tiles here, these weird things. So what we're going to do is just make the following uh, quick change. Here it is. Um, if we have the string, uh, let u be equal to some string u1 to do, let's say, uk, uh, define dot u to be the string dot u, excuse me, dot u to be dot u1, dot u2, dot, 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 dot uk. Define the string u dot to be u1 dot u2 dot, 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 dot uk dot. And then define the string u dot u to be u uh, to be dot u one dot u two dot 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 u k dot okay. Define those st operations on strings. If we have a set of tiles like uh, let's say we have uh, top one, we'll say top start, bottom start. And let's say we have top one, bottom one, top k, bottom k. And let's say end as top end, bottom end. We can convert this to a set of tiles that any match for the set of tiles has to begin and end with exactly the string, the tiles that we want. If there is a match at all, it's a match with, with our forced start. So that's the way we'll fix this problem. And we'll do so by transforming this to a set of tiles that looks like the following. It's going to be dot ts top start over dot bottom start dot. Notice that this tile does not end with the same symbol. So it must not be the last tile. And because it starts with the same symbol, it's going to be the only one that starts with the same symbol. It must be the first tile. Then we'll define t1 to tk as uh, t1 dot over, uh, excuse me, yeah, dot t1 over a b1 dot, uh, dot tk over bk dot. And then the end tile is going to be dot te dot over be dot. I got that correct? Yes. So uh, notice that there's only one tile that begins and ends with the same symbol because we inserted, we inserted the tile set is now twice as long and twice as ugly. But we inserted these dots so that this is the only tile that starts with dots, the same symbol. Uh, this is the only tile that ends with the same symbol. All the other tiles do not do this. So this must be the first tile. This must be the last tile. And these tiles are the only tiles that can come between. That's how we fix our simulation of adding this a over A, B over B, blank over blank top. That's the way we, we get around it. We force the start, we force the other ones. Questions on this? So in mathematics, this is, a, this is an interesting problem that is unsolvable, algorithmically unsolvable. There does not exist um, an algorithm for this problem. But there are some other problems in mathematics that don't exist uh, problems for. Any, any questions on PCP? On the correctness proof? Right? Um, there's a problem called the mortal matrix problem. So we know PCP is un algorithmically unsolvable. The mortal matrix problem is also an unsolvable problem. Uh, so you're given a set of finite matrices M1, so let's say MK, such that uh, MI is some M by N matrix of integers. Uh, you're given a finite set of matrices, uh, does a product of these equals zero, as in like the zero matrix. So if I give you finitely many matrices, each of integer values, does a product of them equal the zero matrix? Um, 
if uh, n is greater than or equal to 3, this is undecidable. Kind of surprising. Problem in linear algebra, but perhaps you can believe it because it's almost, it's very similar to the PCP problem, right? It is, of course, does have some decidable subcases. It's proven if, uh, the, the, let's say your finite set of matrices contains exactly one inverse. That's a special case that's been proven decidable and so on. If n is greater than or equal to 3, the dimension, it's undecidable. If m contains one matrix, if the, your finite set contains one matrix, it's probably decidable, right? But again, a, a, a mathematical problem which is undecidable in general. Two other undecidable problems I know off the top of my head are uh, n-dimensional knots. We won't talk about what this is, but imagine some sort of giant, ugly sheet that's been folded and wrinkled so many times, in, uh, embedded not in three, space, in three space, but something greater. Equivalence of these is undecidable. Very hard problem in, in general to even formulate, but it turns out that's, uh, there's no algorithm for that. Uh, I tried to study that proof, it was too hard. Um, a more famous one is what's Hilbert's tenth problem. So Hilbert's tenth problem uh, basically is, uh, are you, does anyone know the, this definition of Hilbert's tenth problem? It's sort of a, a formulation of the Entscheidung's problem. He was looking for, given Diophantine equations of integer coefficients, are they solvable or not? Do they contain an integer root? For example, x squared plus y squared plus 1 doesn't equal 0. This has no integer solutions. But consider like 3xy minus 7x plus uh, 2, 6y squared is equal to 0. That probably has an integer solution. X and Y must range over integer values, positive negatives, and the output must be zero. Um, this is undecidable in general as well. In fact, you can convert any algorithm into a specific Diophantine equation. This is Hilbert's tenth problem. Took 20 years to prove by a collection of scientists: uh, Marin Davis, Hilary Putnam, Matiasevich, and Julia Robinson. It, it was a really, really difficult uh, work. It took, you know, a, a, a quarter century. Um, for them to do that. And finally, in the 70s, we, did, we proved it. Basically, the last real unsolvable problem to prove undecidable was proven undecidable, right? Any questions on those? Interesting problems uh, occur all the time. I want to show you one more before we go. We probably have time. Is it this one? Damn it. Is it this one? I'm just going to leave it there. Let's do up top. Oh. Okay, you guys can see that? Perfect. Have you guys heard of this game called uh, Baba is You? Baba is You is in every itch.io bundle of all time. Baba is You is a little uh, puzzle game. Let's just see if we can get into there. Uh, so I don't remember which way I go. Let's do this, is this one. So basically, Baba is You allows you to write the axioms of the game from within the game by combining this block. So right now, see, it says, it says Baba is win. I can't touch the flag because it says flag is stop, right? But if I remove this flag is stop rule, I can now go through the flag wall, right? So, and it says wall is you, but I want to win, so I'm going to just try and combine the rule flag is win uh, and touch the flag. Right, then I touch the flag and I win, congrats. This was not the level I thought, was it this one? Yes, so wall is stop, it stops me, and Baba is you. If I get rid of the wall is stop rule, I can break out of the wall. What do you guys think what happens if I destroy the Baba is you rule? It's undo. I die. Um, it allows you to do some really interesting things. For example, let's see. I do. Uh, so it says it still says flag is win. But how do I how do I get the rule to say flag is win? Instead, what I'm going to say is wall is you, and then I could do one of these. So. Uh, okay. Uh, I killed myself. Let's see. Oh. Hold on. Oh. 
Okay, whatever. I, I lost. Anyway, the point is, it's an interesting game. It has a lot of... It, 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 like, you could feel the n-dimensional character of this game. The reason I'm uh, showing this to you is because it is undecidable, given a specific Baba is you level, if it is has a solution or not. And there was this guy in like 2019, he came out with this paper. Let's see if I can write, I can show you uh, some, his reduction. It's somewhat complicated, but it's relatively simple still. Right, so he, he's explaining the rules here. Okay, that was boring. Control O. Let's do Baba's U. Okay. So here's sort of the reduction that goes on. He is able to give it a certain input. Basically, what he does is he constructs a specific Baba is U level from a PCP instance, such as the Baba is U level is beatable if and only if the PCP instance has a solution. And we know that PCP is undecidable. So by reduction, that proves that Baba is U is an undecidable problem. There is no general algorithm to determine if Baba is U is a solvable level or not. Right? Now, again, the lab, the, by the reduction, it maps to not bijectively to all Baba is U levels, but to specific cases of Baba is U levels. Here he has Baba, which is, of course, the little cute little guy at the top. And he pushes those buttons, and those buttons apply a sequence here of tiles, which concatenate together. And this dog here is something like a clock. It's just making sure you don't push the buttons too fast while the, the gadget computes with itself, right? So here you can see he's selecting a combination of these tiles so that water and fire will cancel out by the time he gets to the end, right? So he's choosing a selection of the tiles, and you can see he's got one more tile to select. Let's see what he does. Yes. So notice the tops are exactly the, the complements at the bottom. That's a restriction he's made, but that's what he'll, he, the proof is still correct. Then he'll push the go button. Let's, let's, let's do it. OK, and that is the way he beats the level, using the level editor. By the way, Baba is you is in every itch.io bundle, but the level editor is free on itch.io. So everyone, I think everyone has played this game. It's on every Android tablet, whatever, right? So this is just a simplified reduction. He needs to do, uh, more formally, the high-level reduction. Let's do the full reduction. I'll just skip to the end. So you can see it's a little more complicated, but sort of the high level is, is why it works. Down here is the encoded PCP instance. He's going to choose a selection of buttons that's going to uh, concatenate the tiles. They're going to travel down this lane until the dog uh, resets the clock for him, and then he's going to be able to choose a different sequence of tiles. So what's the reduction? Um, if the PCP has a match, then there is a sequence of button presses he can press, which will concatenate exactly those tiles together, which will beat the level. If the PCP does not have a match, then there is nothing else. There's no sequence of tiles he can concatenate to beat the level. The level is beatable if and only if the PCP match tiles that has a match. Right? So we see Baba is used undecidable. And we can see that the, the reduction is co somewhat complicated. It takes care of quite a lot of other things. Right? So yeah. All right, that's all I have for you. I'll see you guys on Thursday.